pagi. Selamat pagi. Hampir okay. siang di Singapura. Uh, uh, I will try with the uh, PowerPoint. You see whether it works, okay? Yeah, you can try it. Okay. <clears throat> so, what about your assistant, Michi? Uh, Michi, she will join in anytime. Um, oh, okay. Michi, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Right. I'm actually in already. Okay, oh, okay, good, good. Good morning, Michi. How are you? Thank you for letting me join the lecture. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, Michi is from Medan. Ah, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, are you from Sumatra Utara University? Oh, no, no, no. I just, uh, I finished high school in Medan. Okay. I moved to Singapore. All right, right. So, it's been a while since I really stayed <laughs> Yeah, actually. Okay. Money, how many screens do you see right now? You see, yeah, you we, see? we can see your screen. Is it the main screen or the small screen? Uh, the small one. The small one. Huh? The small yeah, one is the, actually got two small ones. Right? speaker presentation. Maybe yeah, yeah. I think I need to switch that off. Now do you see the big screen now? Yeah, it's still going. Only one, right? Only one screen, right? Right, right. Okay, okay. So can we start now, properly? Yeah, okay. So good morning, everybody. Good morning, students, and also other participants who already uh, joined this uh, course. So uh, my name is Murni Ramli. I'm uh, the actually lecturer of this course because uh, we have a curriculum analysis course that we give to uh, students for uh, semester four. And uh, partly this uh, course uh, uh, has taken by around 61 students. But today the participants is uh, not only students, some lecturers also join and also some uh, graduate students also join the, uh, the what is it, the course. So according to our registration from a uh, form about 100 uh, participants, more than 100 participants join. So uh, today we, we, we have guest uh, Professor Lee Eugene. Uh, he is one of the lecturer of National Institute uh, of uh, Education and Singapore. And actually, we I met Professor Lee in uh, 2016. If I'm not, I'm not wrong. Yeah, we had a conference and seminar in uh, in Solo, and we invited him to join. So uh, 
this this uh, lecture actually the last part of our uh, course because we will soon have vacation and uh, about two weeks uh, later we will have a final exam for students so uh, i will read uh, and inform all the participants about the uh, the rules of our meetings uh, pak chandra could you please show us the slide Okay, the second slide. Yeah, so uh, we hope that all participants will turn off the webcam and also the microphone uh, should be mu muted during the presentation. So we will have, uh, what I said, the, the course uh, smoothly uh, run down. And, Next, uh, the question, all the questions should be delivered through uh, the chat room. So you may ask a question related to the uh, presentation, but please do not ask uh, personal things. And then if you have any uh, uh, issue of the audio, please check your Zoom audio and also uh, the computer speakers. Okay, next. So I will briefly uh, introduce Prof Lee. Uh, the sec the next okay so this is the uh, uh, information about professor lee uh, as i said before he is uh, one of the lecture researcher in natural science and science education in uh, nies and he is doing research on prim primary science teaching learning and also hands on minds of inquiry and curriculum research so partly we we will have uh, time about uh, 2 hours so we, I will give the floor uh, to you to present your, uh, share your expertise. Please, Pali. Okay, uh, can you hear me, Mani? Yeah, clearly. Oh, okay, very good, thank you. So, um, uh, pagi to everybody. Uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, I cannot come to be with you, uh, but we will try uh, meeting through Zoom. Uh, um, it is a very hot day. Uh, sorry, I'm wearing a t-shirt, but my house is so hot. Okay, so, uh, but if I'm with you, of course, uh, I, will, I will wear a jacket and a suit. Um, I'm very happy to share some uh, knowledge about uh, curriculum analysis with you. So, um, yes, if you have any questions, uh, you can type it in or uh, you can uh, write it down and later we have some uh, Q&A later. Okay, so um, let me uh, begin and uh, I'll be, you have the slides and I will go through uh, with you. So give me one minute and I will share my screen. <clears throat> Marnie, can you see the big screen? Is it okay? Not yet. Can you see now? Uh, not yet. Maybe not yet. because I think other participants already see the uh, the show the big screen. Oh, Michi, can you see the single screen? Uh, uh actually, see your PowerPoint slides, like like. Yeah, that's right. I, I wanted to see actually the main screen. Yeah, yeah. Have... Okay, let me Maybe try you again. Can just click the zoom. Zoom, slide zoom. Slide zoom. I'm trying to have the main screen. Yeah. So let me just try once more. Uh, yeah. See whether it works. I just want to have one big screen. Mitch, yeah. do you see the single big screen? No, it's still like... It's still the small screen, right? Okay. I've actually switched off presenter mode, so I'm wondering why. Hmm. Okay. 
PDF maybe and then I can't hear you. You you wanna use PDF instead? Or you got effect from your problem? Uh, no, no effects. Actually, it doesn't really matter. I think I, I will just, um, okay, I'll just try from here and see whether it works. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, it's, I mean, yeah, the point is, uh, okay, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so, um, let me see, yeah, I will share again. Okay, so we are going to try to understand a curriculum. And there are three things that I want you to understand. The first one is how do we organize the curriculum? Number two, how do we um, consider the topics? And number three, we are going to consider about the cognitive demands of the learning outcomes. So number one is a very big idea. Number two is a medium idea. And number three is, well, it's a small but a very important idea. So let's look at the biggest idea first, which is how do we organize a curriculum? Well, a curriculum, uh, we can organize it in different ways. The most common one and nearly every curriculum will have is A, the vertical and horizontal parts of the curriculum. As for B, C, D and E, that depends on the curriculum that we are talking about. But most curriculum around the world, and I'm very sure even for the curriculum in Indonesia, you will have A. Let's have a look at what A is all about. If you look at this slide, what do you mean by the vertical um, dimension of a curriculum? Vertical means that how does a curriculum change over time? What do we have to consider uh, to learn uh, over the years, over the months, over the days? So, for example, in uh, biology, very often we learn genetics first before we study about, um, for example, the topic of evolution. So, let's say in grade, uh, grade 10, you will study genetics and therefore it, it helps people understand evolution when they grow to grade 11. So all curriculum will have this uh, vertical uh, dimension. Topics will change over time and maybe you consider it deeper and deeper over the years. As I mentioned, uh, all curriculum will always have a vertical a dimension. That's the one in black. Can you see the one in purple? That's the horizontal dimension. Sometimes a curriculum also has a horizontal dimension. It makes links across subject in a certain grade. So, for example, Mm, let's say for grade seven in biology, the students will learn about enzymes. And then in mathematics, they will also learn how to make a graph. So when they learn how to make a graph, then they understand what a graph is all about. It will help them understand uh, how do enzymes work. So the horizontal aspects is also um, important for some curriculum. Not every curriculum has that, but I think it's important if you're making a curriculum to consider the horizontal aspects first. For example, what happens if you want the student to learn about enzymes, but they don't know how to make a graph or they don't understand what is a graph all about? then I think it is very hard for them to understand about enzymes. 
they can learn about graphs at the same time, or they can learn about graphs before they learn about enzymes. That's okay. But if they do enzymes before they understand anything about graphs, I think there will be problems. Money, what do you think? Do you think you want to say a few words or shall I just carry on? What do you think? Money, should I carry on or do you want yeah, to say yeah. a few? Yeah. Yeah, sure. I carry on or do I do I do you want to say a few words? <laughs> yeah, I we understand, yeah. Fantastic. So all curriculum will have a vertical and a horizontal dimension. But there's more. In terms of content, we have a few uh, patterns. Sometimes they can be uh, discrete or flat, hierarchical, linear or spiral. Let's have a closer look at what they mean uh, by all these terms. Well, Gopin and Ipin, I'm not sure whether you know, this is a popular cartoon that's shown in Malaysia. It's made in Malaysia and you can also get it in Singapore. We know very well. You know, fantastic. So what happens is that for Upin and Ipin, it doesn't matter whether you miss a few weeks, you don't watch it or you watch everyone. Every episode is standalone. So it doesn't matter whether you miss A or B or C and you are only to watch D, it is still okay because A is complete, B is complete, C is complete and D is, D is also complete in of itself. So this is a discrete or flat structure. Actually, very few curriculum have this kind of structure. So the example given is, for example, if you watch um, Sesame Street, you can watch any episode or you can also miss any episode because whether you watch or don't watch, every episode uh, is okay, is complete by itself. So although I mention it here for discrete or flat, um, actually most curriculum uh, do not have this structure. Maybe for a cartoon, yes, but uh, not for curriculum. This is what we call a hierarchical. The word is here, hierarchical. This is actually uh, quite common in, in science. For example, if D is studying about uh, diffusion, and E is studying about osmosis, after you study about diffusion and osmosis, then you can understand B, which is um, how molecules move in and out of the cell. And once you understand B, and if C, F, and G are also covered, then you can understand A. So many curriculum actually um, behave this way. They have a hierarchical stu uh, structure. You must understand the simpler concepts, the simpler topics, the simpler ideas first before you can move on to the more difficult or the more advanced concepts. So my example was, you must understand diffusion, you must understand osmosis, before you can understand how do substances move in and out of the cell. There is another pattern in curriculum. It is called linear. Linear is you must understand the concept, a topic, or an idea before you can do C. You must do D and C before you can understand B and you must understand D, C, and B before you can understand A. This is very common in mathematics. For example, D, for example, this can be, how do you add? How do you subtract? Once you know how to add and subtract, then you can know how to 
multiply. And once you know how to multiply, then you can learn how to divide. So in mathematics, uh, this kind of pattern is actually uh, quite common. Linear pattern. We also have it in science, but mathematics presents a very, very good example. We also have something called a, a spiral. Okay, the spiral is here, where it's a little bit not so clear, but the idea is that we need to understand A1, B1, C1, before later in maybe another year, we do A2, B2, C2, and maybe in another year, we do A1, uh, A3, B3, and C3. So this is an example of the spiral curriculum where um, as you grow older, as the child goes from elementary to secondary to college, um, she will see the same topic, but in greater depth and in more detail. So in many curriculum, um, we have uh, good examples of a spiral uh, curriculum as well. And I'm very sure if you were to look at the curriculum in Indonesia, uh, you will have the same thing. Um, so far, are there any questions that you want to ask? Anybody want to say something? I, I know you asked it right now, but do you want to say anything if you wish? <laughs> uh, may I have uh, to do small translation, a brief translation properly? Please do. Yeah. Uh, Uh, mahasiswa dan para partisipan, jadi tadi yang dijelaskan oleh Prof. Lee ini adalah model-model uh, penyusunan kurikulum. Kalau kita lihat tadi, uh, ada model yang flat. Flat itu berarti uh, kita tidak apa tidak ada struktur yang beruntun. ya. Jadi kita bisa belajar konsep-konsep uh, tanpa harus mengurutkannya. Kemudian ada yang kedua adalah yang modelnya uh, Uh, Prof. Lee, can you show us the slide presentation? Okay. Which uh, which one? Okay, you tell me, okay? Uh, just wait a while. Yeah, I just want to uh, explain about the, uh, what is it, the structure of the curriculum. Yeah, which the one? one. Uh, the, 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 the hierarchical one. Okay. Eight, slide eight, yeah. Kalau yang ini, ini adalah model yang konsep-konsepnya uh, berkembang dari yang sederhana, misalnya D dan E itu adalah konsep yang sederhana menuju ke B. Dan uh, konsep terbesarnya atau main konsepnya itu adalah A, atau core konsepnya adalah A. Sehingga untuk bisa menguasai A, siswa harus menguasai dulu konsep D, E, dan uh, B. Ini mungkin kalau kita contohkan pada ekosistem berarti yang D, E itu adalah konsep tentang abiotik, biotik, lalu yang B itu adalah interaction. Nah, kemudian yang uh, the, the next slide itu adalah uh, yang bentuknya linier. Nah, kalau bentuk linier ini berarti konsep yang paling atas itu hanya bisa diraih secara berjenjang dari yang bawah. Misalnya tadi Pak Li mencontohkan matematika, jadi orang akan bisa menguasai konsep uh, apa namanya perkalian atau pembagian itu kalau dia sudah paham tentang pengurangan dan penjumlahan. Dan yang selanjutnya, the next slide uh, yang spiral, ini adalah model yang terbanyak dipergunakan ya dalam pengembangan kurikulum karena modelnya berjenjang. Jadi di siklus yang pertama spiral 1 itu adalah misalnya di jenjang SD, kemudian spiral 2 SMP, lalu yang selanjutnya di SMA. Seperti itu. Tapi dalam topik yang sama ya. Jadi misalnya ekosistem itu kan dipelajari dari SD, lalu SMP, SMA sampai perguruan tinggi. Oke, Pak Li, thank you. Okay. Maybe I want to ask a question from your students. Which okay. one can they find in the curriculum in Indonesia for bio, for science? Which one can they find? Yeah. Maybe I show the words and they can figure it out. Do they find flat or hierarchical or linear or spiral? Which one do can they yeah. do they think is present? Okay. Okay. Uh, kalau menurut uh, student, mahasiswa, dan juga para peserta semua, ini nanti silakan yang mau menjawab bisa langsung menjawab dengan menyalakan mute-nya. Kira-kira uh, kurikulum pendidikan IPA di SD, SMP, SMA 
itu mengikuti atau biologi mengikuti yang pola yang mana? Apakah yang flat, hierarki, linear atau spiral? Silahkan jika ada yang ingin menjawab. Silakan. Ada yang menjawab? Silakan. Mahasiswa yang mengikuti mata kuliah telah kurikulum setelah menganalisis kurikulum e, biologi atau IPA kira-kira mengikuti yang mana? Ya, silakan. Kalau menurut saya spiral. Ah, according to the student is a uh, spiral. Oke, okay, why? Kenapa, Mbak? Mana tadi yang jawab? Mbak Nilam, kenapa? Karena materi karena materi pembelajarannya dilaku, uh, dipelajari lagi di jenjang SD, SMP, SMA. Diulang tapi dengan kompleksitas yang berbeda. Because uh, they uh, students from elementary to middle schools, they have uh, the same Uh, content or the same topic but in different uh, level of concept oh yes that's right uh, can can we can you tell me one example of a concept ada yang bisa memberikan contoh satu konsep ah, okay so I will try to answer because nobody Uh, no worries. Yeah, so we have actually, for example, the topic of uh, plant classification. Mm. Uh, during elementary, they learn about uh, knowing what kind of plants and also uh, found the similarities and also the differences between two plants or three plants surrounding them close okay. to them. And then uh, go to the middle school. Uh, they try to learn the kingdom of plantae, but it's not uh, compl as complex as uh, high schools. Hmm. In high schools, they learn how to classify the uh, plant according to uh, morphology, anatomy, and also the genetic one. Yes. Okay. So that's a good example of a, a, a spiral curriculum. Okay. I would want to uh, carry on, so I will share again. Okay, so uh, this picture shows you another way in which uh, we can organize the curriculum. Yeah. And let me just show. Yes, so this is considered a top-down approach. That means you have a big idea and then you organize or you arrange the small ideas below the big ideas. Now, Ali, uh, I'm sorry, can, could you please uh, make zoom of your presentation? Just uh, put a plus plus in a. Yeah, I'll make it bigger. Yeah, make it bigger. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So this is for high school biology in Singapore. In high school biology, there are four big ideas, cells and biological molecules, genetics and inheritance, energy and equilibrium, and finally, uh, biological evolution. So in high school biology in Singapore, These are the four big ideas that we arrange our topics. And below these four big ideas, we have the smaller topics. So this is um, just one example in which we have the big ideas and the smaller concepts or the topics are arranged below. So this is, um, you know, it's, it's in, Intentional is is done this way. Of course, when you study, you do one ta 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 ta. But then, if you were to see everything together, you will realize that there are four big ideas: one, two, three, and four. 
Okay, so this is considered a uh, top down. You organize it according to how you think um, biology uh, needs to be taught. It follows the discipline. Let me write down the word here so that you can see. So this is the word. It is trying to follow the discipline of biology. There's another way called, if this is from the top, there's another way. Uh, this is from the bottom. Okay, so let me just show. It's very small, it's not so clear. Okay. Okay, the idea is that in a bottom-up curriculum, we want to see the student will learn these things first before the student will learn this thing here. And after the student learn this thing, she can learn other ideas. This way of organizing a curriculum tries to understand how a learner learns. Okay, so let me just uh, write it down so that it's easier for you, okay. So it's in the bottom up is how a student learns best, for example. Okay, so it's a different way of um, organizing a curriculum. Bottom up, how a student learns, and from top down is it follows the discipline. Let, let me just change it slightly. Money, do you think I want to translate at this point here? Okay, um, really sorry because my internet connection just sure. on and off. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, can you show us the, the slide, okay. properly? Yes. Okay. Can you see for so, C? Pada, yeah, thank you. Pada bagian ini, Prof. Lee menunjukkan tentang kurikulum biologi di uh, Singapura, ya, di SMA terutama. Jadi kalau kita lihat, ini yang sudah kita pelajari pada materi telah kurikulum, ada uh, apa namanya jenjang, ya, urut-urutan sequence dari uh, materi yang diajarkan. Materi pokoknya itu yang kita sebut sebagai core idea-nya. Core idea-nya adalah yang pertama, sel dan uh, biomolekuler. Ya, kemudian genetik dan uh, inheritance, kemudian ada energi dan yang terakhir uh, evolusi. Ya, nah ini kalau kalau di dalam setiap uh, core idea itu ada topik-topik kecil atau ada subkonsep yang di, dipelajari. Misalnya subtopik di sel dan biomolekuler itu ada organel dan seluler, structure dan seterusnya. Nah ini uh, pembagiannya. Jadi siswa dalam model top down approach ini pemerintah apa namanya sudah ditentukan dari pusat kornya seperti apa kemudian uh, dipelajari secara uh, berurutan lalu the next slide dan ini yang uh, bottom up ini berarti uh, apa namanya uh, isinya adalah mengenai uh, capaian yang harus diperoleh oleh uh, siswa jadi kalau ini lebih berbasis pada kompetensi yang akan diperoleh oleh uh, siswa pada setiap uh, jenjangnya. Oke, okay, Prof. Lee. Oke. Okay. Um, so, sometimes you can see in a curriculum, it is top down. And I think that in science, uh, this is quite common. An example of a bottom-up curriculum uh, is one example is also in science. So what must the student learn? The student needs to measure, uh, to do simple skills before he can learn a more complex skills. So yes, there are some examples of curriculum which have a bottom-up approach. But I think most of them will be like this. Sometimes we have a curriculum 
which is what we call a project-based approach. Well, what do you mean by a project-based approach? I can show you an example which is something like a project-based, but it's not 100% the same. Let me explain. In Singapore, for grade seven and grade eight, we organize the curriculum. Uh, it is an integrated curriculum. That means we study biology, physics, and chemistry together. In Singapore, there is no earth science. So when all biology, physics, and chemistry are grouped together, we divide it by themes. So we have a team of diversity, a team of models, a team of systems, and a team of uh, interactions. When we arrange our topics, these are the themes, these are the topics. When we arrange our top topics this way, well, we think that it will help the student appreciate that science is integrated. It is not biology is one side, physics is one side, chemistry is one side. No. In a team, you have biology, physics, and chemistry together. In this team, you have biology, physics, chemistry together. In this team, you have biology, physics, chemistry together. So in a project-based curriculum, it will try to help students understand that science is uh, integrated. Sometimes we want the students to do and do a big activity. Okay, example like uh, you study about birds. Okay, so when you study about birds, you will study about, uh, for example, physics, how they fly. You can study about chemistry. Uh, what they eat, or maybe another example. <laughs> um, okay, well, it's, it's, okay, what they eat. And biology, how they live together. So in a, in a project-based curriculum, we do the activity and then we learn physics, chemistry, and biology in a, a integrated manner. So this example is something like that, but in a project-based uh, curriculum, uh, this, is, uh, more, this is the more correct definition. So Singapore is not a very good example, but it's nearly like that. What I've written in red is the more uh, correct example. Um, Okay, um, Mani, you're, you're free to uh, say a few words. I've, I've said so many things. <laughs> okay, so uh, for that things, I think in Indonesia also, we do not have a project-based um, curriculum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah. have in a elementary and also in a middle junior high school. Mm, yeah, um, yeah. About integrative, uh, thematic integrative. So yeah, they put yeah. uh, Bahasa, Indonesia, social science and science together uh, yeah. based on the one theme or one topic but for high school we do not have uh, yeah so, kind of yeah uh, that means uh, singapore is exactly the same as uh, indonesia yeah. it's, it's exactly the same it's difficult to do a project or integrated activity so uh, so this is about what we can do we have teams can you give me some examples of can your students give me some examples of themes in Indonesia? Can anybody tell me some examples of themes in Indonesia for junior junior school and junior junior high, middle school junior high? Apakah ada yang bisa memberi contoh tentang uh, pelaksanaan pembelajaran atau urut-urutan uh, kurikulum seperti yang disampaikan Pak Li tadi di SMP atau SMA? 
terutama mungkin kalau ada ibu guru dari SMP atau SMA yang bergabung bisa memberikan penjelasan contoh yang tematik sains seperti apa? Silakan. Oh, okay, nobody answered. <laughs> no, no worries. Yeah, so uh, so actually we applied the thematic integrative uh, curriculum since 2013. But in the level of practices, uh, I think uh, our teacher have, uh, still have difficulties to uh, make, uh, I mean, to keep the concept under be understanding, understand it by the students, be understood by the students and also Uh, combining the contextual things in a one theme and we also have difficulties because we still have a national exam but uh, our current uh, ministry have already uh, abolished the national exam so i i hope that teachers have uh, more time and uh, to do uh, contextual base uh, well i say contextual based science Yes, it's again the same uh, problem in Singapore. Uh, it's very difficult for teachers because when the teachers teach, they teach a learning outcome. They don't teach a theme. So teaching a theme is actually very, very difficult. Yeah. So yeah. in a in a in a uh, in this course, I I already had uh, also we learned together about interdisciplinary concept. So it's not only interdisciplinary major, but also interdisciplinary concept. Uh, but okay, then you... understood by the students, and um, we have not yet uh, do the what is it the 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 plan or the learning design plan to put uh, some concepts from different uh, major or different disciplines together? Uh, this plan, is it for you or is it for national curriculum? Uh, so we, we only learn that in the, our course. It's not for the, for the national curriculum, but we hope that uh, our uh, curriculum next will be revised and adopt the interdisciplinary concept. Um, okay. I, I did a study on a, on science in Taiwan curriculum, and I found that they already have input in the curriculum about the interdisciplinary concept. Mm. Okay, uh, it's actually very difficult. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, let me continue. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so just now we try to understand how do we organize a curriculum. For part two, we are going to understand how do we organize the topics. In a curriculum, you will have many topics and these topics are, uh, well, they, they are important. They, they give so much information about the uh, curriculum. Marni, is, is the word topic understood in the same way in uh, Indonesia too? Do, do you have big topics in your curriculum? Uh, yes, but actually in uh, our curriculum, we put the competence. First. Uh, I mean, yeah, so when I uh, ask students about the, uh, we put topic actually, but uh, in our curriculum, uh, it mentioned about the competence that students have to uh, achieve. Yeah. So sometimes students do not actually understand what kind of uh, exactly the concept that uh, put in a should be put in a con in a competence. Yeah, but uh, for a topic, you have uh, you have a number of competencies, right? Right. Right. So, for example, for cell, you have, for example, uh, the cell, the parts of the cell. How does the cell uh, divide uh, movement of substances in and out of the cell? So we have the topic of cell, but below it, we have a number of competencies. I think this should be about the same, right? Okay, so 
what when I think of topics uh, in a curriculum, these are some of the ideas that I think that are quite interesting to me. For example, if I were to look at the uh, uh, topics in Indonesia for biology, the first thing that I want to see is what topics are there and how many of the topics do you have? So how, what you have and how many in English is something, sometimes we call it uh, coverage. What is the coverage of topics in your curriculum? Number two, um, maybe not so important, but I want to know how many topics, for example, in a grade. So in your junior high, how many topics in your senior high, how many topics in your high school, how many topics? This again helps me to understand uh, where do you think the topics are covered most of the time? This idea in English is called focus. Next, we want to look at the sequence. When do the topics appear and when do they stop? Um, I will show you a picture in, in a short while. And finally, for number four, uh, we want to see um, where is your emphasis? Where do you want students to really study this topic? So let me show you a picture here. Here, okay, let me I'll make the picture a bit bigger. So this picture shows that what is, you have a number of countries, you have the grade, and this diagram shows you that for China, grade eight and grade 11 are the years in which the topic of um, ecology is emphasized, plus, uh, well, sorry, plus and plus. For France, grade seven and grade 10, the topic is emphasized. They do talk about it in primary school and in middle school, but grade seven and grade 10 are the most important. And there's another interesting pattern. For many countries, grade seven is the time when they have to study about ecology. The next time they will study ecology is grade uh, 11, 12, and maybe in grade 10. So this is when we want to compare uh, different countries. Of course, if you are looking at Indonesia, um, you will not be able to, you can actually understand this graph. I'll tell you why in a short while, but this is a good way for people to compare different countries at the same time. Okay, so this is when we want to understand how do we organize topics? I'll show you. Um, I'll show you another picture. Okay. Uh, so, Mani, you want to say a few words while I get, while I get the other slides up? Okay. Sorry, Pak Lee, I have problem with my internet connection. Oh, no worries, no worries. Yeah. Okay, but it's the same thing. I'll just give me a while and I'll explain. Okay, so do you see this big table there? Yeah, yeah. Yes, what's happening is that I went to analyze three regions, Hong Kong, China, and Taiwan. When I arrange the topics, the topics are here. I went to count how many learning outcomes are present in grade one to three, how many outcomes are present in grades four to six. In China, we have three levels, one to two, three to four, five to six. Again, I did the same thing. 
So in Hong Kong, grade one to three, I have one competency. In grade four to six, I have two competencies. And three represents the total number of competencies. For Taiwan, there are zero competencies for this topic, but we have six competencies in grades five to six. So this is just a table for me to see for, for three regions, Hong Kong, China, and Taiwan, how many um, topics are there for how many learning competencies are there for all these topics. So it gives me a broad picture of which country emphasizes which topics. Okay. So, um, yeah, do you want to say a few words, uh, Mani? I, I'm not sure whether that's helpful. Okay, uh, while I'm waiting for money to log in, maybe the students, uh, do you have any questions that you want to ask? Okay. Yeah, uh, partly there is a question from uh, the participants here in the chat room. Yes. Do you want to, okay, I can see the thing. Do, yeah, do you want to tell me what it means? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's written in Bahasa Indonesia, so I will try to translate. Um, Nurul Hidayati asked about the uh, organization of the topics. So how should we put the topic uh, based on the grade? And what kind of uh, topics, I mean, the coverage of topic that should be learned by one grade to another grade? What should be the base of, uh, what should be the reason to put the topics in a uh, exact grade? Yeah, that's a very good question. What we must do is I think we need to see like here, we need to, let me share my screen. We need to see from grade one to grade 12, for example, for all the topics, where do my topics appear? Oh, I need to see grade one to grade 12 as a whole. Only then, then I can decide, does this topic come here? Or does this topic, is it appropriate for grade one? Is it appropriate for grade three? Or is it more appropriate for grade seven? I need to see what I want to teach for all the grades uh, at the same time. It's going to be a little bit, um, let me show another picture. Here, I've tried to organize the topics here, and this shows you that where okay so for this topic interdependence of life for elementary young grades and upper grades uh, it is important for plants for young children yes for older children uh, maybe not for cells do you realize that for younger children they don't cover it because it's too difficult it's only present in upper grades for earth science, these three topics are present in many countries, but do you see here? These are the more difficult topics and they are only present in, uh, in a fewer countries. When we look at the topics, we can decide which are easy and which are difficult and which topics we can act like a spiral curriculum. In physical science, these are one, two, three, maybe four, one, two, three, four, 
are the topics in which they will help us uh, build a spiral curriculum. So the students will be studying the same thing, but in deeper and deeper levels. For plants, I would think that photosynthesis would be a good example of a topic in which you will appear when they are in primary school and also in middle school and also in high school. So some topics are very good. They help you to have a um, spiral curriculum. What, um, I'm not sure whether that's a good answer, but let me just say that we need to know what we want our students to know. And after that, then we need to decide on when the topics start and how many times they will uh, repeat looking at this topic. So some topics they'll see for a short while, some topics they'll see for a very long time. And when they see for a very long time, this is part of the spiral uh, curriculum. Does anybody want to say something? Hi, Mr. Lee. Can I say something about what you just mentioned just now? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you're saying that, you know, some of the topics they see uh, overlapping against, right, which is the spiral uh, content structures. And then another one, you know, you see only for a short period of time. Then are you saying that uh, this spiral, uh, linear and hierarchical and this grid, is it, is it that in, in one subject, when they do the curriculum, is it possible that they overlap each other? That means that there's no one curriculum that only use uh, spiral and there's no one curriculum that only use hierarchical. That means they are always... Yes, uh, every curriculum will have a mix of these uh, structures. Um, but it's actually very interesting because of the mix, sometimes we can see a sequence Sometimes we can see a spiral. Sometimes we can see, um, yeah, a linear even. So what we need to do is we need to see for more years from let's say uh, elementary to junior high to high school. And then we can see the pattern uh, more strongly. So you're right. So every curriculum will have a mix, but for one year, sometimes we can see a certain pattern in a very strong way. But usually, usually uh, curriculum will always have a mix. Yeah. It's, it's not possible to, uh, to plan a curriculum according to one pattern. Uh, that doesn't sound so good. It's usually a mix of patterns. Bernie, you want to help me translate some of the other questions? I don't know where she went. Maybe I can help you translate one of the questions for you. Sure. Uh, this is from Wayu Mustika Fitri. She asked if we use... um spiral you know like uh going from one then going more difficult like that would do you think uh for the same topic that is placed at a higher level will actually leads to a higher understanding leads to a better understanding uh answer is yes yeah, so for Wayu Mustika's question, the answer is yes. We think that, uh, for example, 
uh, they will learn different things, but you will learn so many more things about the same uh, big concept. For example, how do plants make food? So in elementary school, they will learn that you need sunlight, you need uh, water. But then when you go to secondary school, then they will study that, oh, they will learn to write the equation, they will know that carbon, carbon dioxide is important, and you will know uh, which wavelength of light is important. And then when they go to high school, they will learn about the biochemistry of photosynthesis. So answer is yes. For some topics, the spiral curriculum is actually very useful because you study it in greater depth over the years. So that's a very um, common example of the spiral curriculum, which is, I think, quite good. Yeah. But not every topic needs to have, needs to follow that. Some topics, okay. Uh, other topics, uh, no. I'll just give you one example where maybe no, of an example of a no. I'm not too sure whether in, in, in Indonesia, you study the topic of uh, evolution. Evolution is a very difficult topic, and therefore I think that only in secondary school and in uh, high school, then you will study the uh, topic. So it's not possible to have a simpler form of uh, evolution for elementary school. It's not so easy. Yeah. Okay, please ask more questions. So, uh, can I just continue from that, uh, what uh, Dr. Lee say? So, you say that, okay, some topics you cannot learn it at a lower level. Is it because of the difficulty that students might have at, when they're younger? I think the answer, yes, I think that's about the reason. Because, uh, for example, in evolution, one important idea they need to understand is cause and effect. Bef in order to have B, you need to have A first. For some children, uh, they do not understand cause and effect. So they don't understand how did B appear, which of course needs A. So because um, they lack this knowledge, therefore it's hard for them to understand um, this important concept. Hence, uh, yes, so some, for some topics, the spiral curriculum doesn't work. It's because maybe they don't have the skills or they don't have the uh, ability to understand that. Okay. Uh, there's another question from Dia Hida Ramadan. Okay, but let me check whether money is around. Are you around money? I think she like yeah yeah but but this is on and off so I just yeah 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 just okay. take the chat and uh, ask Nuki to help me to deliver sure. the okay okay she will do one then you do the next one okay so uh, okay. you want to get the one from Dia Machi you want to help me for Dia's question oh okay I'll have you with Dia question okay uh Dia asks um how is the curriculum in singapore do the project-based um curricular organizer is it in every subject or is it just in science or is it just in certain subjects okay dia if you have the answer can you please tell me because we don't really do it very well we actually do it only in high school, only for one subject. Yeah. So the answer is that we don't do it very well. Yeah. It's very, very difficult to do. So it's only for high school for one subject. Did it answer her question? Yeah, jadi um, uh, let me translate in yes, bahasa. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so Mbak Dia yang tadi bertanya tentang Singapura, di Singapura sendiri belum mempraktekkan 
uh, apa namanya project based kurikulum itu. Jadi Vali belum uh, tidak dapat memberikan contohnya seperti apa penerapannya karena sulit untuk menerapkan uh, project based kurikulum. Uh, the next question Pak Ali is from Ani Zatun Zahro. Hello. Yes, so, yes. She asked about uh, do you also have a learning outcomes for the effective or the domain of effective? Yes, we do. Can you hear me, Pali? Yes, yes. The answer is yes, we do. We do. We do. Yeah. But they are only present for elementary and junior high. For middle, uh, high school, um, I don't think many, very, very few. So the answer is only for primary school and maybe up to about grade eight. Other than that, uh, no more, yeah. Yeah, quite rare. Okay, so uh, yeah, please type uh, more questions. Uh, what I'll do is I will go ahead and I just want to talk about uh, uh, Bloom's taxonomy a bit. Okay, so give me a one. Okay, so we have just talked about how do we organize a curriculum? Number two, we talked about uh, where do the topics, how many topics, which topics. Now we're gonna talk about the learning outcomes, or I think in Indonesia, they call it the uh, competency standards. They all mean the same thing. Let's try to, I, I like to call them learning outcomes. So I'll just use for a short form, L-O. One way to understand um, learning outcomes is to ask, how difficult are they? Well, we have a way to classify how difficult a question is or how difficult is a learning outcome. And that method is to use revised Bloom's taxonomy. In revised Bloom's taxonomy, there are two big things that we can use to help us. The first one is the cognitive process, and we have six. And the second one is the knowledge levels, and we have four. So we can uh, classify or code, C-O-D-E, every learning outcome, every competency standard according to six here and four here. And I've done that for elementary school for a number of countries. For example, here, let me make it a bit bigger. So this is for the one, two, three, four, five, six, cognitive levels. And these are the one, two, three, four, five, six uh, countries or regions. So for Japan, for their competency standards, most of it is applied and very few others. For China, according to their uh, cognitive levels, most 40% is understand. In Taiwan, most of it is under apply, around 40% as well. In Korea, 
oh, this number is really high, it's 62%. But even 62% for their competency standards is nothing compared to Japan, which is nearly 95%. For Singapore, it's quite even. One third remember, one third understand, and one third apply. So most of the uh, coding for cognitive level for Singapore is remember, understand, and apply. These three are very common in school, level one and level two. For these levels, uh, four, five, and six, they are quite rare. And this is exactly what we find. And the numbers are, well, less than five. And for Singapore, it's even a zero. So this is the first one here, the cognitive process. Let's look at the knowledge levels. Here. So, and one, two, and three, and four. And this is what the pattern looks like. So for Japan, most of it is here and a little bit there. For Singapore, again, most of it is here and a little bit on the other side. For Korea, this is very strong. So 80% here and about 20% there. So this is a way to understand how difficult or how easy are your competency standards. At this point, let me just stop for a few minutes and ask, um, is, uh, do, does anybody know whether in Indonesia, uh, where, how, how do you think the picture will look like for your competency standards? Do you all okay. analyze Bloom's taxonomy in Indonesia? Um, yeah, we actually put the uh, Bloom taxonomy as one of the uh, base of, to assess our student uh, student competence. But I think uh, we still, according if we analyze the uh, not only the curriculum but also the assessment, I think we still put uh, strength in uh, strengthen the remember C one, C two, and C three. Uh, but actually, in our national standard, the uh, government put uh, higher order thinking skills as one of uh, should be assessed in a, in a, for students. But uh, in reality, we still, uh, most of our teachers use uh, the lower level. Yeah, it, that's actually okay. I think uh, one and two, level one and level two is actually okay. Uh, but maybe not 100%. I would think that if 70 or 60% level one and level two is okay. So we have about 30 or 40% uh -huh. higher levels. I think that would be quite good. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, okay, so have your teachers uh, practice using Bloom's taxonomy to classify the learning competencies in Indonesia? Uh, yeah, we use a uh, Bloom taxonomy. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so maybe I'm going to ask them a question. How do you code a learning competency using Bloom's taxonomy? Can they explain to me? They can explain in Indonesian. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anybody? Um, yeah, you have 80 Pak, students. Pak. Yeah. Pak Ali bertanya, apakah uh, sudah pernah menganalisis uh, kurikulum di Indonesia, misalnya kurikulum biologi, dengan menggunakan taksonomi Bloom? Dan kalau sudah pernah, menggunakan kode seperti apa untuk menandai yang uh, misalnya level C1, C2, dan seterusnya? Apakah ada di antara para peserta yang pernah melakukannya? Mungkin Bapak Ibu dosen yang pernah melakukannya? Sometimes they only put, uh, for example, the uh, C, C1, the coding is C1, C2, C3, based on the competence uh, written in a curriculum. Yes. 
Brian, I hear your students. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, have, I have a very high uh, respect for your university. So, yeah. <laughs> Mahasiswanya bisa berkomentar ya kalau sudah apa namanya pernah melakukan atau misalnya uh, pernah ada praktek untuk menganalisis kurikulum, silahkan disampaikan uh, seperti apa caranya menentukan bahwa uh, apa menerapkan taksonomi belum dalam melakukan analisis itu? Yeah, what do they look out for, and then how do they code? Yeah, what are they coding? Yeah, can somebody tell me that? Hmm. Uh, ada yang bisa menyampaikan ke Pak Lee, misalnya di dalam analisis kurikulum itu apa yang dicari? Ya, terkait dengan taksonomi belum, kemudian bagaimana cara uh, mengkodenya? Ada yang bisa menjawab? Silakan. Oh, nobody. <laughs> <laughs> They are very shy. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, maybe I ask. Uh, um, does the learning competency in Indonesia have a verb and does it have a noun? Yeah, we have. So we call it uh, operational verb in each competence. Yeah. So I think uh, students will find the uh, Bloom taxonomy based on the that uh, verb, operational verb. And okay. for noun, uh, for noun, they found about the uh, what is it? The topics, for example, for bacteria, uh, they learn how to analyze uh, about the relationship between the the shape, the organ of bacteria, the structure of bacteria, and also the uh, function. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. So uh, I'll be interested in looking at the uh, learning competencies in a, in a short while. Let me just share again my slide and I, okay, let's see whether it makes some sense. Okay, so for uh, using revised Bloom's taxonomy, we must identify the verb. What does the verb do? The verb actually helps you determine which is the cognitive process. Number two, we need to understand the noun. What does the noun do? The noun helps us to understand what is the knowledge. So we have the verb, we have the noun, we have the process, and we have the knowledge. So I think that uh, many of the learning competencies will have verbs and nouns. And therefore, when they have verbs and nouns, we can quote them by Bloom's taxonomy. Um, the next thing that we need to do is we need to make a, when I'm doing my research, I need to find a glossary. A glossary is something like a dictionary. Let me show you what it looks like. Um, yeah, let me show you what a glossary looks like. So uh, this is my glossary. So for remember, understand, apply, analyze, and evaluate and create, I have words here which belong to remember. I have words here which belong to understand. I have words here which belong to apply. As I do my research, I find out when I analyze the learning outcomes, this competency standards are at new verbs, new verbs, new verbs, new verbs. And eventually, um, this is, helps me to understand for every one of these uh, verbs, these are the synonyms. Synonyms are words, words which mean the same thing. So remember, these are verbs which belong to remember. For understand, these are verbs which belong to understand, and so on and so forth for all of them. Okay, let me ask you, I'm just so curious. What's a good translation for the verb remember in Bahasa Indonesia? What would you use to translate remember? 
Remember, remember, we call it mengingat. Okay. What about understand? Understand is memahami. Do you have verbs which are very similar to understand in Bahasa Indonesia? Synonyms. Yeah. Do you? I'm sure you do. I think in every language, yeah. you have many, many words which mean the same thing. So, yes, yes. so when I'm, when I'm uh, checking my learning outcomes, my competencies, I need to make a glossary. So this is one example of what a glossary looks like. So, yeah, Mani, I will be very interested in talking to you more about making a glossary for Indonesia. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me continue. Okay, so this is point number two. In point number three, do you know that very often, some very often there are what we call typical or expected pairings. Um, remember, usually goes with factual, understand, usually will go with conceptual and apply. This is three, C3 and also K3. So C3, K3, C2, K2, C1 and uh, K1. So this is actually very, very common uh, everywhere around the world. Yeah. Okay. And next is that um, when you analyze the learning outcomes, you must see what the uh, Com what the competency standards say, you must not say that, oh, I'm a teacher and I want to teach it this way. No, you must look at the phrase and just code it according to what you see, not according to your, to you as a teacher. So you must pretend that you are not a teacher. You must pretend that you are just a, a reader of the learning competency. And next is that, Sometimes your learning competencies are very long and they have many verbs. What do we do? Usually I take the hardest verb, not the easiest verb. Let's say two or more verbs, I take the hardest verb. And somebody asked me about effective LO. Well, effective LOs should not be coded by Bloom's taxonomy. It does not code effective learning outcomes well. Okay, I'm going to stop here and maybe uh, ask you if you have any questions so far. Yeah. Um, here's some question from Michi. Michi asking about the uh, Indonesia uh, teacher, what the challenge uh, that teacher uh, face to apply the remember factual knowledge or understand uh, conceptual. So why teachers in Indonesia uh, uh, not, uh, do not apply the uh, C3 level or uh, higher cognitive demand? Yeah, uh, I think because of, um, uh, what is it? The, maybe because of the difficulties and we have the long history to apply only the lower uh, order thinking skills. So uh, it's quite difficult to uh, teach to change the mindset and also the uh, to to push themselves uh, to mm. to make higher. I mean to, yeah. to improve the uh, assessment or the uh, strategy of learning. Yeah, I am sure. Um, and of course, if you teach in a rural school, it's actually very difficult to have uh, to do hands-on activity, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's just very difficult. <laughs> okay, we have a question uh, for- question to Singapore. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so I think the answer is that uh, we cannot monitor. It's very difficult. What we can do is we can um, encourage the teacher to teach according to the right level but um, 
it, it's very difficult to monitor, yes. So we hope that the teacher will understand the learning outcome, will understand the teaching competency, and she will teach it in the right way. But I don't think the school or the government will want to monitor. It's very, very difficult. Mm. Okay, Pali, I want to show you the uh, curriculum of Indonesia, maybe uh, from the curriculum of biology so we can uh, see the analysis. Let me sure. find, the, yeah, let me find first the material. <laughs> Okay, so oh, um, money. I've got one question. Huh? Yep, yep. I'm going to ask everybody to think very hard. See whether you can tell me what's the difference. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm sharing my screen. Uh -huh. Okay. So the first question is LO number one, use microscope to learn how to observe cells. Learning outcome number two, use microscopes to learn about cell structures. I want to ask, how do you think you will quote number one and number two? What's the difference between them? Money, do you think you can see whether you can translate into in yeah, yeah. bahasa, please? Yeah, yeah, oke. Okay. So, uh, ini ada tugas dari Pak Li. Yang pertama adalah, ini kita diminta untuk membedakan uh, apa kata kerja operasional atau indicator yang bisa diuraikan dari uh, learning outcome atau kompetensi ini. Yang pertama adalah menggunakan mikroskop untuk mempelajari bagaimana mengobservasi sel. Terus yang kedua adalah menggunakan mikroskop untuk mempelajari bagaimana struktur sel. Saya ulangi, yang LOI 1, yang LO 1 itu adalah menggunakan mikroskop untuk mempelajari bagaimana cara mengobservasi sel. Yang kedua adalah bagaimana menggunakan mikroskop untuk mempelajari struktur sel. Nah, Tolong ada yang menjawab, ini e, membedakannya seperti apa? Jadi kata kerja operasionalnya apa yang bisa dipakai untuk LO1 dan LO2? Silakan. E, untuk yang menjawab bisa meng, e, unmute the microphone-nya bisa, atau bisa juga menjawab dalam bahasa Indonesia, nanti saya translate. Silakan. Mahasiswa, silakan. Mbak Alisa, ini ada bergabung, silakan. Oh, oke, okay. they uh, answer in a chat. Ah, uh, oke. Okay. Okay, I will read it. Uh, Ya, Mbak, Mbak Ani itu mengamati sel menggunakan mikroskop. Ya, maksudnya adalah eh, Pak Li meminta itu kalau kita mau coding, mau menguraikannya menjadi kata kerja operasional itu bedanya apa gitu? Kata kerja operasional apa yang dipakai pada LOI 1 dan LOI 2? Ada yang bisa? Silakan. Jadi kalau yang LOI 1 itu kan menggunakan mikroskop untuk mengamati sel. Ya. Sementara yang kedua adalah menggunakan mikroskop untuk mempelajari struktur sel. Artinya berarti yang pertama adalah seperti apa? Silakan. Ya, sampaikan pendapatnya silakan. Uh, so one of the students say that for the uh, LO1, it should be uh, observe, observing, and LO2, understanding. LO1 is identify, to identify. Mm. 
Okay. <laughs> Let me change it. Okay, so uh, this is how I would uh, code it. So what is, may I just ask, uh, what do you think is the verb here? Yeah. Uh, untuk yang LOI satu, itu kata kerjanya apa? Ada yang bisa jawab? Silakan di, di unmute saja speakernya. Silakan. Kata kerja yang dipakai untuk LOI satu. Silakan. Ada yang bisa? Kata kerja yang dipergunakan untuk LO1. Menggunakan mikroskop untuk mempelajari bagaimana mengobservasi sel. Silakan. Saya rasa kalau untuk LI1, LO1 mengidentifikasi. Ah, they say that we use the identify. To identify. Mm -hmm. Is that a verb or the noun? Ah, kata kerjanya apa, kata bendanya apa. Jadi kalau kata kerjanya tadi mengidentifikasi misalnya, terus ini kata bendanya apa? Ada yang bisa? Kata benda itu maksudnya berarti konsep atau materi yang mau di apa namanya dipelajari. Jadi kalau kata kerjanya itu kata kerja operasional yang dipergunakan. Sementara kata benda itu berarti konten atau konsep yang dipelajari. Silakan. Maunya struktur sel. Oh, yang mana? Yang LOI satu dulu, Mbak. Silakan. Ayo, come on. <laughs> It's okay. It's actually hard, ya. Yeah. <laughs> Identifikasi struktur sel, Bu. Yang mana? Yang LOI 1 atau LOI 2, Mbak? Satu, Bu. So, the first one is to identify the structure of the cell. Oke. Okay. Dan yang kedua apa, Mbak? Halo? Silakan, Mbak Dewi tadi yang menjawab. Yang kedua apa, Mbak? Okay, let me uh, help you. I think maybe it's hard because uh, it's not a very direct translation. Yeah, let me yeah. show you what do I think are the verbs. This is a verb. This is a verb. Are they the same? Yes. Yeah, the same. What is different is the noun. Mm -hmm. So the verb here is use microscopes to blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And therefore it is apply. Okay, well, I can write it here. It's the same. Mm -hmm. is, uh, is everybody happy? This is level three, C3, apply. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. So Uh, ini tadi, jadi kalau yang diwarnai merah oleh Pak Li itu adalah kata kerjanya ya, kata kerja operasionalnya, menggunakan mikroskop untuk mempelajari. Nah ini kalau dibuat indikatornya atau dimasukkan dalam taksonomi belum masuk pada kategori C3, apply. Terus yang berwarna biru itu adalah nounnya atau kata bendanya. Oke okay, Pak Li. Ya, yeah, it's because of the word use. So use is means to do something. So that is why it's apply. But there's a big difference. Okay, so here is to observe. You're right, is to identify structure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here is actually um, the knowledge is um, 
procedural. This is a uh, tree. So apply is also tree. And procedural is tree. But here, there's a difference. Spectral. And this is two. You see the difference? So yeah. sometimes, I'm not too sure, I think it's the same in Bahasa. We have to read the competency standards very carefully because they look the same, but they are not the same. So this one tells you the aim is to do something. You learn how to do something. And this one will be learn about cells. Okay, so it's difference. Okay. So learn about cells. Mm -hmm. And this one is to learn how to do something. Yeah, so well, I can tell you what's something you don't have to observe. Yeah. Yeah. So it's different. So the first one is tree tree. And the sec uh the second one is just a uh, tree two. So I think uh when we want to look at the learning outcomes, uh, we must be very careful about reading it. And this is, I'm just showing you one example. So does anybody have any questions? Yeah, if not, we can we can look at the curriculum in Indonesia. Okay, so uh, ini tadi penjelasannya apakah sudah dipahami? Jadi kalau kita menggunakan kata kerjanya uh, atau level now kognitifnya itu ada di C3, tapi kalau dimensinya ini berbeda karena yang nomor LOI 1 tadi itu adalah menggunakan mikroskop untuk mengamati, jadi artinya untuk belajar bagaimana cara mengamati sehingga dia mem, e, di situ ditulis e, mempelajari bagaimana mengobservasi, jadi e, apa namanya masuknya ke psiko motorik mungkin ya. Tapi yang kedua itu adalah meng apply, jadi tetap menggunakan karena ada kata use berarti levelnya masuk dalam kategori yang C3 meng apply menggunakan mikroskop untuk mempelajari sel. Nah, struktur sel itu sendiri masuk pada kategori konseptual atau dimensi yang kedua. Apakah ada pertanyaan terkait dengan ini? I'll stop sharing, then you can share. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So can you see the uh, my file? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So actually, I tried to translate the uh, what is it the biology curriculum in Indonesia from uh, senior high school to uh, what is it to elementary. Yeah. So let let me show you the uh, senior high school uh, grade uh, twelve. Yeah. And yeah. we call it uh, in Indonesia curriculum. We have four competencies. One is for a spiritual competence. The second one is for uh, effective mm -hmm. domain, and yeah. the third one is for con cognitive, and the fourth one is uh, about psychomotoric. So okay. I will show you the third one, the cognitive yeah. one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 For example, yeah. <clears throat> for example, the uh, first uh, competence in the uh, uh, grade twelve is analysis the relation between the internal and external factors of organism growth and development. Through mm -hmm. experiment. Yeah. So according to this competence, uh, teachers should uh, break down the competence, the analysis here to uh, some indicators. Uh, yes. So it means they will put uh, some uh, operational word uh, to, for example, to analyze the relation between uh, the internal. First, they have to analyze the structure, uh, the internal uh, factors. The second one analyze the external factors, something like that. Yes, yes. Okay, so 
because here they put analysis, it means uh, the cognitive level should be uh, C4. Yes. Okay. And the second one is understanding the role of enzymes in the metabolism process and the display the data on metabolic process based on investigation and literature study. Yes, C2. Understand the energy composing yeah. of the living yeah. beings. Yes. Yeah. So because here understanding, it means they have to uh, put the category in C2. Yes. I realize that you have a lot of C4, yeah. Yeah, uh, C4 in the third one, this yes, also C4. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. C4, yes. That's not, okay. I have analyzed the high school curriculum for Singapore and guess what is the most uh, common one? Which level? C1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6? Mm -hmm. What do you think, Mali? <laughs> Uh, you mean in in a Singapore in, in high school? school? Yeah, biology. Uh, I I couldn't catch. Okay, what what do you think is the most common one? C one, two, three, four, or five or six for biology oh, okay. high school? In, mm. uh, in 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 Indonesia, I think they put the higher order thinking. Sure. Scale, I mean the higher level. Okay. Some, mostly uh, analysis. I will show you the next uh, level, the next okay. grade. This one is also uh, understanding and analysing, yeah, yes. then applying, yeah. C3, applying, analysis, analysis. So mostly analysis. One is okay. evaluating, uh, C5. <laughs> then for grade uh, 10, understanding, analysis, applying, applying, applying well. Playing hmm. analysis, so okay. it, it seems that it, it seems that we do not have concentrate. Uh, for example, to put uh to stressing one uh, cognitive level in a in each grade. For example, I mean, for example, in a ten grade, we only concentrate on the uh, for example C one to C C three, then go to the uh grade eleven to C four and C five, then. Well, we can put also C6 in a, a grade 12. Oh, okay, okay. And for uh, the junior high school, I also have the uh, the curriculum. For junior high school, describing, it means uh, C2. Hmm. And here, I forgot to put, <laughs> to put the operational word. Oh, it's okay, okay, I can it's see. Louder. Yeah. <laughs> So here, distinguishing technology process, distinguish it means in a C2 or C3. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, I think that's quite a good uh, coding that you have done. Let, yeah, that's quite amazing. <laughs> yeah, I think you did a good job. I want to, yeah, let me just show you something from Singapore first. Yeah. Okay, I'll, sh I'll share my screen and maybe see what our, your students will say. Okay, so this is for grade seven and grade eight in Singapore. Mm -hmm. So again, you see C1 to C3, uh, most of the time it's here. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. C C2 is very common. For grade 10, again, C2 is very common. Okay. Let's look at uh, your high school. Mm -hmm. And this is for Singapore. And look at that. It's just C2 money. Oh, Not, okay. Yeah, zero. Oh, see. Zero. Yep, yep. So that means uh, the Indonesian curriculum uh, is just by learning competencies. Uh, it's much harder than Singapore curriculum. Right. <laughs> yeah, but the result is different. <laughs> I mean, according to the PISA test. Yeah, yeah, but I'm just saying very, very that. Low. <laughs> yeah, but I find it quite interesting that when yeah, I code, when I coded it with with my student, uh, this is my result. Okay. So yeah. it, means, uh, it means probably in Indonesian curriculum is uh, already put the higher order thinking skills uh, in the curriculum, but 
in reality, probably uh, those things have not been applied. Uh, uh, I think so. Yeah. yeah. One thing we need to realize, and I think uh, every student here, they, you need to know, is that we are just analyzing the intended curriculum. Mm -hmm. I think most of the problem in learning occurs at the implemented curriculum. That means what the teacher does. I think that's more important most of the time. So we are looking at the planned curriculum, but it's more important to understand mm -hmm. teaching in the classroom. So Indonesia has, your curriculum is harder than Singapore. You look at this for high school. Okay. Uh, our most common one is C2. You look at C, C3, only 7%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Most of it is just C2. So, okay. Uh, but Professor Lee, what about the teachers? I mean, okay, the curriculum in Singapore is only C1, C2, or C3, but actually in the school level or in a teaching level at school, probably teachers already applied the more, the higher uh, cognitive yes, level. Yes, you are correct. Yes, they might be pushing it up higher, even though it's, let's say, C2, they might be pushing out to a C4. Mm, yeah. or C3, for example. So you're right. It's, it's not the intended curriculum is important, but what happens in the classroom is even more important. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe at this point, yeah, we, yeah. Uh, yeah, if there are any more questions, I think it's, it's quite a long session, but I'll be happy to listen to any questions. Yeah. There is a question about why you put the uh, cell structure as a conceptual uh, uh, in a previous slide about LO2, learning outcome two. Uh, why you do not put it in a, as a factual? Ah, because I like it because the cell structures are all related to each other. So in conceptual knowledge, when the ideas are related to each other or there are relationships or there are linkages, mm -hmm. uh, it's okay to classify as conceptual. There's also possible to classify as C1, mm -hmm. but I think um, because they're all related and there are many, many concepts. So I think C2 should be okay for that. The, yeah, level two, K2 actually. It's not K1, it's K2. Yeah, yeah, because uh, here, I think some students also find, uh, find difficulties on dif uh, distinguish between uh, K1 and K2. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So K4, I think uh, most schools around the world will not have it. Yeah. It's too difficult. Yeah, metacognitive, right. Okay. Other question is, uh, okay, written in English, probably. Yeah, yeah, I just answered it. They will reteach you. Yeah. What will teacher do when most of students do not understand or reach the LAO? Yeah, reteach. <laughs> yeah. You have to reteach. They won't move ahead. They will stop and start yeah. again. Yeah. yeah, okay. So, Are there any uh, other questions? That, yeah. I know that, uh, what is it that, uh, the teacher uh, training in Singapore uh, more better better than Indonesia. So uh, when I joined one conference and Singaporean teachers presented the uh, research in the classroom, they were really really amazing. So uh, do you have any special teacher? I mean, what what kind of teacher training that you prepare for them? Mm. I think there's uh, many opportunities for professional development. So I think that's very helpful. Yeah. So after they graduate from university, every year they have many opportunities to learn, to train, and to improve themselves. Mm, I see. And don't forget, uh, probably uh, Java, the island of Java is maybe a thousand times bigger than Singapore. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right. Over a thousand times. Yeah. Okay. 
So, uh, Pali, uh, do you have also in a Singapore curriculum about, for example, I found uh, something something interesting in uh, Japanese curriculum, science curriculum. For example, uh, in a science grade three, four uh, grade three, they just uh, keep students to to uh, train the ability to classify, to observe and classify. Then in the next grade, grade four. They concentrate to uh, add, to find what factors um, influence uh, some phenomena. For example, plant growth. Uh, what uh, what factors? For example, find the water and also mm. uh, air. And mm. in the next grade, they try to find the variables and design the small experiment. Uh, so, is it also applied in a, in Singapore uh, primary schools? Uh, it depends on the teacher, but in the curriculum, um, there is no sequencing uh, this way. Yeah, mm -hmm. Maybe next time when they reform the curriculum, they will try to improve the process skills better. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but right now, no. The next uh, curriculum in 2023, I think they will try to improve the, the sequencing of the process skills. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah we, we will change it to practices of science, but I think Japan is quite advanced. They, you see, their curriculum makes sure that the students will do something in order to learn something. They are, many of the LO are very similar to LO number two. Mm, you will okay. do something to learn a concept. So it's C3, yeah. K2. Uh, K2. Yeah, the, their LO is written is C3K2. Most LO, especially in Singapore, is C2K2, but in Japan, it's C3K2. C3 K2. Yeah, that's quite interesting. Yeah. I see. Yeah. In Singapore, no, it's 2 yeah. 2. And two, two. also in Taiwan, I think it also follow Japanese. Yeah, it's Taiwan, very similar. Uh, C3K2. Yeah. Okay. Very, very, um, very, very interesting. <laughs> yeah. So, so Singapore, uh, Indonesia, I think if you have a lot of C four. Ah uh -huh, no, <laughs> it's just written in curriculum. I mean, the, our curriculum is too high to be achieved by our teachers. Yeah, but it's 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 there. It's official. So that's that's unusual. Yeah, because yeah. in Singapore, it's only C one. C2. Mm. Not, not not so many C3, C1 and C2. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But the, the important things that in the re, in reality, in fact, the teachers apply more than C2 in Singapore. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, apakah masih ada pertanyaan kepada Prof. Lee? Silakan. Okay, I think sudah dipahami semuanya. I think I'm very tired and very hungry. <laughs> yeah, I think it's enough. <laughs> okay, it's, it's already lunch time. Okay, yeah. I think uh, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Lee, about the. Uh, to share your expertise and also about the science curriculum in Singapore. We learn a lot and I, I hope that we can uh, do uh, the same analysis in Indonesia uh, curriculum, science curriculum, then we can uh, improve our, uh, well, we, we still need to revise our curriculum to uh, relate it to the fact yeah, in a school level. Sure. Thank you very much, yes. Thank you very much to join us and also Michi, thank you very much. Uh, see you next time and uh, uh, have uh, good health in this uh, pandemic situation. Yeah, thank you very much properly. Bye bye. Okay, thank you. Yeah, bye bye. We'll keep in touch. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Bye. Mm.
Oke, okay, untuk mahasiswa kelas uh, A silahkan mengisi absensi di uh, OCW. Dan kalau ada pertanyaan lain nanti bisa di uh, chat ke saya, saya akan bantu menjawab kalau masih ada yang ingin ditanyakan kepada uh, Prof. Saya akhiri uh, kuliah online.